So yes, we kind of know their life better than their wives. Russia is probably the most transparent society in the world because you can buy data on anyone. Western intelligence agencies blew it. How come the intelligence services never found out that these people, they didn't have a birth certificate, they didn't have a mother or a father? So there's a new investigation into one of the latest operations that the public is not aware of yet. So this guy is taking over a lot of functions, networks and connections in the Middle East and in Africa from Prigozhin, from, from Wagner. That might explain why I'm also on the kill list. Have I achieved anything? Well, to disable the generation of killers is not a bad thing. Christo Grozov, Head of Investigations at Insider. Thank you for sitting down with us today. Um, we're going to be talking about the unit that you've never heard of, but you should know more about. 29155. 29155 of the Russian Military Intelligence Service. What is the difference between the FSB and the GRU, the agency that this unit belongs to? The main difference, nominally at least, um, is that the GRU should only work abroad. And the FSB, which is the sort of um, heir to the KGB, should only work domestically and in countries that were part of the Soviet Union before. There's a little bit of competition between the two uh, for some um, locations, for example, the former Soviet countries. Both of them are trying to be the dominant intelligence power. Um, mm -hmm. And also even parts of Russia that are considered to be uh, fringes, such as uh, Dagestan, Chechnya. You would see GRU officers also occasionally go there to conduct assassinations. But other than that, the main difference is domestic, FSB, for example, the assassination attempts on polit polit political leaders in Russia or opposition leaders in Russia, such as Navalny and Vladimir Karamursa, was conducted by the FSB. Uh, whereas if the same people need to be targeted abroad, as we have seen in other investigations of ours, this would be the, the GRU who would do that. This unit is actually doing some of the most prominent attacks against the West and against what Putin perceives to be his enemies. Uh, unit 29155. Who are they? 29155 is a very large unit within Russia's military intelligence. Its official nominal purpose is to train other people in the business of explosions and sabotage and assassinations. And that uh, encompasses about 400 people. Within this unit, there's a subunit with no name. I mean, sometimes it's called K2, sometimes K200, but it's a subunit of 29155 that does the international operations for the GRU. And these include the same sabotage operations, explosions of munition facilities of the enemy, and the enemy is essentially everybody but Russia, and, uh, and assassinations. And this unit trains people to be what is known as illegals, however, a different type of illegals. The illegals are people that you would be familiar from the show, like the Americans. Uh, Russians who live under a fake foreign identity as Canadians or uh, South Americans for all of their adult lives abroad, and they stick to a legend or a cover story of who they are. These people within the unit, the subunit of Tuna Wafai 5, they're short-term illegals. They are sent for a couple of weeks abroad on their fake identity. The identity is Russian, but it's not their identity. But many of them live for years in Russia under a fake identity. So it's a very weird situation of illegals within Russia. So these people have to have a social media presence under the cover name in Russia, they have to get sometimes education under cover identity. Uh, one of them, for example, is a director, a film director, under his fake identity. And he needed that because he needed to travel and spend some time infiltrating the artistic circles in Barcelona, in Spain. Uh, another one has an identity as a trained insurance broker, and that's a fake name. But he lives in Russia and travels abroad under those, that fake identity. So about 70 of these gems were created since Putin decided that the world is an enemy. That was about 2007, 2008. Uh, and these were big investments in creating these fake identities. And these 70 people have traveled around the world for the last 15 years, as I said, blowing up bridges, blowing up munition facilities, killing people, and infiltrating opposition diaspora groups of Russia. So that's who they are. I mean, it feels like you were almost in there when they were making all of these decisions and creating this group. How do you know so much about that? The reason we became so knowledgeable of it is because 
my team and I started looking at what happened with the Salisbury po poisoning in the UK in 2018, where Sergei Skripal and his daughter were poisoned and a completely random innocent British woman was assassinated, was killed by these people because they're so careless to leave one of the um, sort of perfume spray bottles, which was used to disguise the, or to carry the poison with. So we started looking at this unit then. We had a couple of pre preceding investigations with Roman Dobrohotov, which pointed to the existence of such a unit. We found who they really were, the real identities, and then by just doing simple things like cross-matching their travel records with other people who traveled with them on the same booking and getting access to their phone call metadata and seeing whom they call most frequently, we discovered this universe of about 70 assassins who talk amongst each other, who uh, call each other on Christmas or New Year's Eve in Russia. So on the 23rd of February, which is uh, Defender of the Fatherland Day, uh, you have to compete with the others to be the first one to call the boss. So we knew literally who the boss is and who the boss's boss is because of this confluence of phone calls early in the morning because they all wanted to be first. But more than that, they traveled on passports that were easily identifiable as fraudulent, as fake, because they were all in consecutive batches of numbers, of serial numbers. And actually, that's how we found many of them. So yes, we kind of know their life better than their wives know their life. The telephone metadata, you have access to that. How do you get that kind of information? As my colleague Roman has frequently said, Russia is probably the most transparent society in the world because you can buy data on anyone um, and not just on regular people, but also on spies. And it's because of the corrupt market of the law enforcement in Russia. So I guess Salisbury, the Novichok poisoning, the first instance of using Novichok in such a public manner um, was kind of the coming out party for Unit 29155. What else uh, have they been involved in that people should know about? Interesting, because what happened is Salisbury exposed them, but it wasn't the first time they had done something in the public um, eye. It's just that people didn't know, we didn't know, that there was that unit. Oh, wow. So we found that the same group of assassins, um, including one of the people who had been in Salisbury, had actually been in Bulgaria three years earlier, exactly at the time, on the day when a Bulgarian arms dealer, an arms manufacturer, had fallen ill with symptoms very, very similar to the Novichok symptoms. He had been selling weapons to Ukraine, ammunition to Ukraine in the early days of uh, Russia's invasion of Eastern Ukraine in 2014. But at the time, nobody knew about Novichok, nor about the existence of this unit, um, of this Russian unit. And Bulgarian investigators had chalked this off as rugula poisoning uh, during the dinner. And the a rugula? A rugula poisoning, yes. <laughs> and the victim who survived uh, barely was yelling, saying, I hate arugula, I never, I would never try it. But the prosecutors just said, no, no, you had arugula and there was a little bit of pesticide in the arugula in that restaurant, uh, which probably explains away why you fell ill. We had to then go back to the prosecutors and uh, ultimately these three people are now on Interpol's wanted list. But the armaments were sold to Ukraine anyway. The armaments were sold to Ukraine and Ukraine we talked to people uh, that were involved in uh, procurement for Ukraine at the time, and they said that this guy had actually saved Ukraine in the first days of the war. Wow. Yeah. So they knew who they were going after. Yes. Yeah. And I think this is the same unit that was involved in targeting the Bulgarian arms industry at large with actual just straight up, you know, explosive devices. Correct. Hidden in kind of very clever ways. Can you tell us about that? In one particular case, we got access to the original planning blueprints of how they were going to do the remote explosions, remote detonations in Bulgaria. Um, and we found that they had developed this remote detonator that was packaged in a, um, a, in a router, in a Wi-Fi router, and in order for them to be able to cross borders with it without it raising uh, alarms, um, and uh, that is almost a pun because the explosive detonator was in fact a car alarm that they had embedded in the router so that they could use a, the, the remote uh, control for the car alarm to 
to cause the, the thing to explode and then the thing would be connected to a larger explosive and so on and so forth. I feel like I've seen that in 10 movies where somebody hits and it, the car keys and the car explodes. And then the question is who who copied who? Uh, was yeah. it uh, the Russian spies who had watched too many movies and decided to do this way? But in this particular case, what was particularly sort of uh, innovative is that they had planted the explosive in this remote uh, detonator in one country uh, in anticipation of the goods to move to another country. So they planted it in Czechia and they knew that three days later this uh, this cargo would move to Bulgaria and they would be able to remote detonate it in Bulgaria without even being there wow. and not leave a trace. One particular um, attempt that they did was to hide it in uh, in uh, apple juice, in a package of apple juice. Um, and um, if I remember correctly, another one was just a, a computer case. And uh, well, they would just hide it in a lot of different things. But in every case, the electronics behind, uh, behind it were based on car alarms, uh, simply because that is easily obtainable and it's something they can do while even being abroad and in the field. So they don't have to go back to headquarters in Moscow to get some uh, very, very sophisticated electronics. They can do it on in the field, and that's very important for this unit. And the photographs of this that you hacked from their emails, those are actually the mock-ups that they made when they were practicing um, how to create these devices, right? That is correct. That is correct. Um, but because each of the mock-ups that was delivered to the boss for approval um, was accompanied by a letter saying, this is, these are the specifications and the characteristics of the device, and it, all of them ended with the device is ready for deployment, which is a spooky statement, uh, if you know what happened after that. This is all happening uh, after the war in Ukraine started in 2014, right? Do you think that uh, the reaction from NATO, you know, sort of was proportional to what was actually happening, to no. attacks no. inside a NATO member? Uh, attacking facilities that are crucial to to NATO and any munition storage facility is crucial to NATO uh, in any NATO country. Uh, and killing people is, in fact, an attack on the sovereignty of, of NATO. And uh, I think what we are failing to see is a combination of a failure, failure to understand what happened because law enforcement never figured it out until now. Uh, now Czech and Bulgarian prosecutors are going after uh, Russia and the GRU as the culprit, but it didn't happen at the time. And because it didn't happen at the time, there was no public support for any uh, confrontation with Russia, no political support to confront Russia and to ask questions or to even impose a cost on Russia. And now the war has started, so Russia has no reputation cost remaining and uh, they're all sanctioned out. So I feel like the, this attack on NATO um, has remained un, um, un, uh, unrewarded. So Western intelligence agencies blew it, basically. I'm sure that they blew it because for at least a decade, um, these people were going around blowing things in Europe and Asia and America and were leaving traces. Um, they were like asking to be caught, but nobody did. They didn't exist in real life, yet they were getting visas. And during the visa application process, somebody should have figured out that these are not real people. But more than that, they traveled on passports that were easily identifiable as fraudulent as fake because they were all in consecutive batches of numbers, of serial numbers. And actually, that's how we found many of them. They, they didn't have a birth certificate. They didn't have a mother or a father. Um, so I, I have to believe that if intelligence services were worth their uh, salary, they should have been able to figure it out, that out and not allow these people to travel. But here you go, for 10 years they were traveling and blowing things up. So there's a new investigation into one of the latest operations that I think uh, the public is not aware of yet. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we had a universe of about 70 people and for about half of them we could see that they were trained in explosives and um, and they had traveled to places we, where we could tie them to particular events, but there were a few of these members that we had no understanding of what they were doing and where they were traveling. And one of these people, we, uh, to our consternation, found 
to have become, under the fake identity that he was given, a member of a large number of opposition diaspora groups uh, operating as human rights organizations um, in Europe or in the United States. And he had become an accepted member of at least two of these organizations. One was the Saharov Center for Protection of Human Rights. Oh, wow. And the other one was the Free Russia uh, Foundation. And uh, he had been invited and attended many of the sessions abroad mm. of these organizations. He had gone to Vilnius several times, to Kishinev a few times, um, to Vienna for these meetings. And uh, he had even managed to infiltrate one of the important committees of, uh, of, the, of these meetings, which was the Sanction List Drafting Committee. So he was allowed to have a voice in who gets sanctioned. In a commission that was choosing who to sanction in Russia. That was proposing to governments, Western governments, who to be sanctioned in Russia, which is extremely cynical. And uh, we noticed that this particular person had traveled not to every meeting of the foundation, but particularly to ones that were attended also by one of the prominent names in the organization, which was um, Gary Kasparov, the world champion uh, chess player. And now dissident. And now dissident, and probably one of the most outspoken critic of President Putin out there, and somebody that we can clearly imagine why Putin would want to have killed. And it was, again, a blood-curdling discovery to see this person, this spy traveling under a fake identity, trained in the dark arts of the jury, including assassination, be so close to Kasparov, even at photographs. And um, even before we proceeded to publish, which we will, uh, this investigation, I, I called Gary Kasparov up and, and warned him that, that this is uh, what has been happening. And uh, Wow, how did he react? Uh, I was surprised at how matter-of-fact um, of a person he is and, and how he's like, yep, I knew it was bound to happen and thank you for telling me. And uh, here's all the data on this person that I can, um, uh, that my colleagues can find and just do your work. Do you think that uh, he knows his cover is blown? I think he does um, because he had traveled under a consecutive passport uh, or, or on a passport from this range and we made public our understanding of these patterns. We know about 70 of them. Maybe there's 100. Maybe there's maybe we don't know all of them, but they don't know what we don't know. They don't know what intelligence doesn't know anymore. So that has disabled this generation of expensive, trained uh, spies. And it will take a few years before, before Russia can generate a new generation of equally trained or better trained spies. So I think we're living in this twilight zone between two generations of assassins. Well, that's quite an achievement for you. Well, that might explain why I'm also on the kill list. And how did you find that out? Uh, well, first of all, like Gary Kasparov, I always assumed I must be on it, but um, a couple of events gave me positive information. One is that actually uh, somebody reached out from the intelligence or apparatus of Russia who was a fan of my work or our work with Rowan and, and gave us a very clear warning that he had just seen evidence that we are on the kill list. And then uh, Western law enforcement, and I'm not going to specify which one, but uh, law enforcement had essentially found people with with the instructions on how to surveil me and, and Rowan. And some of these people are arrested now, so that's how. Well, if you and Roman Dobrohotov are single-handedly responsible for dismantling an entire generation of Russian GRU spies, then I guess it isn't a surprise that they want to get rid of you guys. They were living a life of uh, uh, to be envied. They were traveling around the world, having unlimited credit card allowances. We've seen that during their trips abroad, um, which was supposed to be in the interest of the of national interest of Russia, uh, they were having parties with prostitutes. They were buying all the credit cards issued by the GRU, clothes, expensive perfumery, jewelry, not only for their wives, but for their lovers, for their lovers' children, which suggests that maybe that's also their children, and so on and so forth. They were living this life that few Russians could uh, afford, and suddenly they have to be stuck in... Uh, 
a little village um, outside of um, uh, Zelenograd near Moscow doing trainings of other people in the mud. I think that that causes a lot of anger. It sounds like you really pissed them off. Well, that's a good feeling sometimes. Uh, with it late at night, uh, thinking of, have I achieved anything? Well, to disable a generation. You know, they've accomplished a lot, but it sounds like they've also been pretty stupid in the way that they do things, using passports with consecutive serial numbers, uh, for example. Um, so somehow this hasn't stop their rise through the ranks in Russia. And it seems like this unit and this unit's leader um, just keem, keeps climbing the ladder. We only have to be slightly better than the competition. It doesn't pay to be too good because if Western intelligence were idiots, why would they actually invest in better or, or trade craft than the, the one they had? And for 15 years, they were not caught, which means we're laughing at them, but they've been laughing at us. And I think the latter explains why Putin has been promoting them, because they were able to penetrate through the defenses for so long. You know, the commander of Unit 29155 was recently photographed sitting next to Putin. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the context of where that photograph was taken and why this is an important development? The uh, chief commander of this unit um, is a general called uh, Andrei Averiano. Uh, born in uh, uh, 1967 in Lush Lushambe, and um, he was the founding father of this unit uh, in its most, in what they call kinetic form, in the, in the most aggressive form, in about 2007, 2008. Mm. So everything that this unit has done has been credited to him. He himself liked to get his hands dirty, and he traveled under a fake identity to some of these operations, to the most important ones. Um, and this risk-taking is something that Putin apparently appreciates. Um, when Prigozhin started his mutiny, it became clear to the Kremlin and to Putin that uh, he cannot trust any individual uh, from the private sphere to be a loyal proxy for the state. Prigozhin, the leader of Prigozhin, the leader, the founder, the leader of uh, Wagner, who later uh, fought his own death um, after the failed coup against uh, the military and against Putin that he initiated. Um, and in fact, Putin had to look around from his inner circle of siloviks or people from the power elite of Russia for somebody that he trusts completely and somebody who's not, uh, let's say, wealthy enough to be an independent player. And it seems that he singled out Andrei Averyanov, the head of this scary unit, and he presented him, and that's how the photo and the video emerged, to the African uh, leaders and dictators that he had gathered in St. Petersburg for a forum as the new security um, advisor for you guys who would replace Prigozhin. So this guy is taking over a lot of functions, networks, uh, and connections in the Middle East and in Africa from Prigozhin, from, from Wagner. They had their fingers in multiple regimes in Africa and in the Middle East, and they were you know, providing security to all these dictators. And when Prigozhin was killed, people were asking themselves, well, does that Russian influence in those regions just poof, disappear? What happens next? And it seems like this is what's happening. But it's important to understand the uh, why Putin had to show this person sitting next to him. It's it's a rare occurrence. Putin never showed Prigozhin physically sitting next to him. And it's not a good operational tradecraft uh, symptom to show a top secret guy publicly. But when Prigozhin um, went down in flames, literally, um, all of these people in Africa, they all of these dictators, they had a surge of distrust to Russia, because this was our guy. This was the guy that helped us climb to power in many cases. This is the guy that protected us from downfall. And suddenly they're getting rid of him. Um, anyone else who would have shown up and said, hey, I'm the new, the new Prigozhin, would have met a sort of a wall of distrust. Putin had to physically put this guy next to him and say, this is your new guy, and I am, I am in charge of him, and I'm sending him to you. 
So this really explains why he was there. Um, whether he will take all of the markets, all of the countries in which Prigozhin's army was providing these uh, nefarious services to, I don't think it will be all of them because Putin now distrusts any one person to be the 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 guy who, who keeps the keys to all of Africa, all of Middle East, but at least for a large part of Africa and Middle East, uh, Averyanov is this man. Which means that these people who will no longer travel to Europe and blow things up here and, and in the United States, most likely will be recycled as advisors or as trainers or as assassins in Africa and the Middle East. What do you think motivates people who uh, operate in these clandestine organizations abroad at great personal risk to themselves, um, but also doing really you know, nefarious things like killing people with chemical weapons? Why would somebody want to be involved in something like that? You can roughly see two different groups. Uh, uh, the majority are people who came from small villages with poor pet families, sometimes uh, orphans. Uh, all of them had gone to military schools, um, the Suvorov schools, uh, which are kind of cadet schools. Uh, but they had no social elevator in front of them in their uh, non-army, non-military lives. And suddenly they get picked and sent to this elite unit and they were expected to be loyal to the army and to the state forever because they were dragged out of the mud in some cases literally one one of the guys the guys the guy who was uh, uh, part of the poisoning of uh, Sergei Skripal uh, grew up in a village of 400 people in the permafrost that in fact for a large part of the year had no physical way uh, rolled out of the village and only when the the frost became completely hard only then they, they like for three months of the year people from that village could leave the village so imagine this guy suddenly having a credit card and amex and being able to travel to london and to paris so this is about 80 percent of the people and 20 percent of the people actually are sons of generals and sons of important uh, GRU uh, colonels and generals from the before who just used the nepotism inherent to any Russian structure to get that uh, lucrative position. And these people not only had access to credit cards, but had access to stashes of cash. We were able to read the emails of one of the core members of the team at the start of the war. He was deployed, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, he was deployed as one of the a small core kill team, advanced kill team that was sent to Kiev to assassinate Zelensky and uh, and uh, people around Zelensky, uh, and they thought it would be a five day operation, obviously. But when it failed to be a five day operation, and he was stuck there for months and months and months, he started communicating by email with his wife, and um, some Russian hackers were able to obtain that shared with us. And it was very telling, not only about the the fact that they believed that the war would be a one-week war, um, and they were very disappointed when it wasn't, but this person was instructing his wife to go into the stash of cash that he had hidden behind the library and to take batches of $10,000 each and to buy apartments because he wasn't sure what would happen to the currency and he wanted to at least uh, secure the future of uh, his family. This is a guy who was getting an official salary per year, maybe $20,000 for years. And what he was able to spend on sort of uh, banking against the demise of the ruble was definitely at least a million in cash hidden behind the, uh, the, the, the library, uh, the bookshelf. So, Clearly, that's the result of their corrupt uh, collusion with criminal groups. Wow. And despite communicating with his wife via unencrypted email is like such bad tradecraft. Well, thank God for that. Um, Christo, thank you so much. So interesting speaking to you. Really appreciate it. Thank you.